Hello and welcome to the World Soccer Talk podcast, your weekly dose of talking about watching soccer on TV, online and apps. Coming up on episode 52, we feature an exclusive interview with New York Cosmos uh, chairman Rocco Comiso, where he has some eye-opening things to say about USSF and Major League Soccer. Plus, we have a ton of soccer news to share, in addition to our thoughts about the World Cup draw coverage from Fox. Uh, plus, we have letters from you, the listeners, in our mailbag section. My name is Christopher Harris, a.k.a. The Gaffer, and I'm joined today by Kartik Krishnaya. Now, Kartik, uh, we took last week off because of Thanksgiving, and uh, this uh, podcast uh, in particular, we're uh, releasing a little bit later because we wanted to, ac- wanted to co- accommodate the interview with uh, Rocco Camiso, but also wanted to share our thoughts about the World Cup draw. So it's been a, a whirlwind uh, two weeks of lots of things to talk about. So uh, if it's okay with you, we'll dive right in. So first of all, let's give our feedback first on the uh, FIFA World Cup draw uh, live from Kremlin that happened that was uh, televised live on uh, FS1 as well as uh, Telemundo. Yeah, so uh, Fox had more commercials, first off, in, in the first half hour, and seemed to have uh, a, co- a commentary analysis for a few minutes and then break for commercial. Telemundo uh, had their uh, their talent on site in Moscow uh, at the Kremlin, whereas uh, with the exception of Fernando Fiore, the Fox team was in studio in Los, in Los Angeles. Uh, Rob Stone and Kate Abdo show, sharing hosting duties on the same set, which was a, a little bit awkward, but I, I think it worked. And then uh, for me, the other takeaway, and I tweeted about this for those of you who follow me on Twitter, uh, Landon Donovan, um, I don't disagree with him, but Landon Donovan decides that when uh, he's being asked about who he thinks could be the breakout star of this World Cup, he says Sado Mane. Very good answer. Yep. And then talks about him potentially moving on from a bigger club than Liverpool. Now, um, I agree with him, and I'm someone who uh, lived as a Man City supporter and someone who tried to cover Raheem Sterling's move from Liverpool to Manchester City, objectively and fairly. Lived through Fernando Torres' move from Liverpool to Chelsea. Lived through Luis Suarez's move, although that was less controversial, from Liverpool to to Barcelona. Um, I think Donovan is right. But he's a former Everton player, and we know how Liverpool fans react to these sorts of things, to any kind of perceived slight that somehow some other club may be bigger than them. When Torres moved to Chelsea, Chelsea was very clearly a bigger club. When Sterling moved to Man City, Man City was very clearly a bigger club by certain definitions. Um, But I I thought that was interesting. Uh, I have to say, Donovan... Uh, for me, is very good. Uh, his analysis during this World Cup draw special was uh, was outstanding, uh, I thought. Um, and uh, maybe that's a transition. Maybe he's going to be in the studio rather than the booth. He'd been in the booth for the game, the Columbus-Toronto game, uh, two nights prior on uh, Fox. I'm not quite sure what their role is for him. Maybe he becomes like their Taylor Tolman who can do both. Yeah, I doubt it personally. I think it's just in terms of just the uh, dynamics of what's, what's happening uh, at the World Cup draw. If the U.S. had made it, perhaps you'd have Landon Donovan in Russia uh, alongside Kate Abdo and have the two of them there. Um, and, and, but instead, you, mean, you, you bring everyone back and stay in, uh, leave them in the studio in Los Angeles and then just send out Fernando Fiore and probably one cameraman and just kind of uh, leave it as a skeleton crew there. But, I mean, to me, Donovan, I think he might come on as uh, some analysis point, points of view in terms of in that World Cup. Uh, we'll have to wait and see. But most of the time, I believe, will be in a commentary booth. But, but I could be wrong. Uh, my initial thoughts in terms of the coverage, a few things. Uh, one is that uh, no surprises for a lot of uh, listeners here, but they definitely went Mexico heavy. So you had uh, you know, just over yeah. 30 minutes of, of previews, uh, quite a lot of talk about Mexico. Fox has had a whole string of disasters that have happened um, over the last couple of years in terms of uh, in, in antis- anticipation of the, of the World Cup coverage. Of course, the biggest one with the U- U.S. crashing out. The next worst-case scenario for Fox would be that if Mexico uh, didn't make it past the group stage, then it, then they're really, really in, in a tough situation in terms of uh, viewership. But from this uh, initial, uh, the World Cup draw, we, we, we see that they're definitely going in heavy uh, on Mexico. Uh, you know, one thing that was pretty uh, telling to me, though, was that Mariano Rivera is trying to be uh, an objective commentator. 
uh, on that set when Rob Stone is pushing him, I think to try and get the answer, yeah, this is going to be the best Mexico team uh, in several generations, uh, he wasn't very uh, confident, right? He was basically expecting the same sort of failure we've come to uh, expect from Mexico in every major tournament. And uh, uh, I I think that that's going to be the the, um, competitive uh, feel of the Fox set as they, they pursue this line of coverage because you've got on one end the very kind of American instinct that they've pushed with the U.S. men's national team to not be critical, to not uh, give proper analysis when things are very clearly not uh, adding up for the U.S. As I complained about all summer during the Gold Cup, where uh, Fox's coverage just completely turned me off the entire tournament. And if you want to remember what I said at the time, go back and listen to uh, to some of the shows during that period. I, I was at a, a Gold, uh, Gold Cup match and couldn't believe Fox's analysis when I, I saw with my own eyes something completely different than they were reporting on or commentating on uh, uh, in the booth. And that led to ultimate failure because it created this sense of uh, this the, this sense of uh, um, uh, of delusion. Now, I think they want to do the same sort of thing with potential fans who might be engaged in the Mexican national team going into this World Cup and guys who are Mexican uh, with a Mexican background, Mexican American, uh, Mexican commentators who they will have on their set like Rivera may not let them. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's, uh, uh, sorry, like Tr- Trujillo right. uh, might, might not let them. Um, I think uh, I called him Rivera earlier. I apologize. Mariano Trujillo, I, I think, was who is very good. And I mentioned that during the Confederations Cup. I really liked his analysis. He's a guy that uh, understands the um, difficulty of uh, advancing in a competition like this. This isn't just um, an NCAA tournament situation where a team could get hot and they're Cinderella teams. Fox likes to portray it that way, or American commentators like to portray it that way. What it is, is it is, a, uh, with the exception, with maybe one exception in every tournament, a real thinning out of teams based on quality, based on pedigree, based on, to a large extent, history. And um, that's tough for Mexico to overcome. Mm-hmm. Uh, a couple more things in terms of some of the uh, things to look out for or things that we saw uh, from this broadcast. One is uh, obviously uh, not any mentions of the U.S. men's national team. Of, of course, they didn't qualify for the tournament. But I was almost waiting to see if they would actually do a short segment on that. Or well, Thank God they didn't, so that, that's good news. But the, the other thing that's more important to me is that today's face of the Fox Sports' World Cup coverage for the World Cup draw was Fernando Fiore. Personally, I like him. I think he's entertaining, he's funny, he's jovial, but he does set a, a particular tone, which is very, very comedic, very clownish, very um, just fun and fr- frivolous. And that is such a departure from anything that, uh, say, ESPN had done in the past or that, say, an NBC Sports would do. Um, I, I, I just wonder, you I mean, does he appeal to the bilinguals? I, I know there's a lot of Hispanics uh, in the United States that do not like him, um, so it's probably mixed. Does he appeal to the soccer diehards? I don't think so because he, he dilutes the conversation and makes it kind of uh, fun and jokey rather than being a little bit more serious and talking about the X's and O's. And is he a good representation of what Fox's World Cup coverage wants to be? I, I don't think so. I, I but who else do you put into that slot, though, other than bringing in some different talent uh, to be that person? I, I, I like him. I just think by the time that the World Cup is halfway through, we might be a little bit sick of him. Um, so it's definitely a liability. What, what do you think, Kartik? Yeah, I would agree with that. I like Fernando Fiore. He knows the sport, but uh, he is not uh, being utilized in in a fashion where he deploys that knowledge. He's being utilized in more of a comedic role, which is, um, I think, troubling. Uh, However, I do have some high hopes that Fox, with the U.S. out of the tournament, and and those who listen to this podcast regularly will know, uh, six to nine months ago, I was saying the best thing that could happen. Now, I didn't want the U.S. to miss the World Cup, so this is a, a bad scenario for the overall game and we've already seen that with, with layoffs of people who, who are our colleagues who write about this 
sport and less investment in, on the media side in, in, in this sport in the United States by virtue of the U.S. missing the World Cup. That's also what happens in a country that hitches its entire soccer culture to a national team and not to the, the club game or to the normal facets of, of football. But not that's just, another... Not just to the sport. Yeah, 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 to the sport itself. That's a, that's a topic for another day. But um, the, the point I was going to make is that I was saying six months ago, nine months ago on this show, those of you who are just general fans of world football, you cannot wait for the U.S. to get out of this tournament. The U.S. hopefully will be out in the group stage for that reason, so Fox can just cover the tournament instead of making everything about the United States. Well, guess what? We're at that stage now in on December 1st with the World Cup draw, with no United States, and um, the Fiori central role thing uh, worries me because of the tone he's taken and the comedic aspect of it. But I think uh, when I see Donovan, when I see Trujillo, when I see Lawless talk about uh, guys like Mohamed Salah, talk about Juan Carlos Osorio, there might be a more serious nuts and bolts aspect to Fox's coverage that we would not have seen if the United States had qualified. And that, that, I think, for general fans of football is uh, a good thing. It's unfortunate it took the U.S. missing the World Cup for that to happen, if that, in fact, happens. Now, Kartik, throughout this tournament uh, coverage by Fox Sports, uh, are we going to be wondering how Fox's coverage would have been different if the United States had qualified? Yes. Yeah, yes. and it's going to be interesting, though, too, because in many ways, in the back of our minds, we're going to be thinking, okay, well, obviously, they, they've, they've taken some budget cuts. Uh, they've reduced the number of people attending um, the event in terms of uh, the, the, the tournament, uh, in terms of uh, the number of people that are going to be working this. And uh, hopefully, I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's a long way to go. There's plenty of time. And we'll still find out who the, their talent's going to be and the commentators and all the details. But uh, in the back of our heads, I, th- I think it's always going to be the question, okay, how different uh, should this have been if the U.S. had qualified? To me, though, Kartik, it shouldn't be that different. It should still, it's a massive tournament. This is the, the biggest tournament. I mean, it's big, bigger than the Olympics. This is massive. So no matter if the U.S. is in or not, uh, Fox should have been preparing to make sure well, yeah. it's the best thing possible. Yeah, it's the biggest uh, sporting event in, in the world, right? The biggest uh, uh, non-annual sporting event uh, on the planet. So that that's uh, something Fox should have been uh, focused on. Given the amount of resources, the amount of money they spent on acquiring the FIFA rights, but instead, I think so much of it was built around uh, a hubris and expectation around the U.S. men's national team, which um, now, you know, of course, these are the FIFA rights. So they get the Women's World Cup with it and the U.S. women's uh, national team have won or the world champions currently. But um, the, the hubris around the U.S. men's national team and how that would drive their coverage of everything related to the FIFA contract on the men's side, be it the U- U-17 and U-20 tournaments uh, and especially uh, the World Cup. Now, um, they're forced to rely on a certain degree of, uh, of soccer knowledge and, and uh, uh, global world football knowledge, which they have not displayed as a network covering the sport the way ESPN has. Uh, ESPN, of course, had the FIFA rights for, for years, for two decades. And, uh, but it wasn't, be, it wasn't merely because they had the FIFA rights that they assembled a team of, of uh, talent that could cover all aspects of, of a World Cup tournament. Um, I'm also, uh, we know they're going to have some National Geographic specials. We know they're going to have some, um, some outside the uh, lines type, uh, type programming uh, with this World Cup. But I still worry about Fox's inability to gather news and to react to news and react to things that happen around major sporting events like the World Cup, like the Olympics, like the Euros. I still wonder what would have happened if Fox had been covering the Euros last summer in France when we had uh, all kinds of issues of, uh, around hooliganism and, and uh, 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 fan behavior at the tournament versus the way that it was covered by ESPN who have uh, some very newsy people on their soccer team, the, the likes of Gab Marcotti, who is a journalist who can gather information uh, as well as anyone in the English uh, speaking press in this, uh, on the planet and the resources of ABC News who of course have a, a bureau in Paris who are able to assist in, in uh, uh, this aspect of, uh, of covering a major event. Uh, Fox does not have that. Fox, Fox News, I don't want to sound too political here, Fox News 
uh, is a uh, political commentary. You know, they're they're they're. Their people on air tend to be political commentators or former political uh, people who've worked in politics. And then they've got the resources, I guess, of Sky News. But Sky News has got has got a similar kind of um, bent. bent to it yeah. at times, right? And quite honestly, may not have as many people on the ground in Russia because they're not a rights holder. Uh, Sky Sports is not a rights holder. So uh, I wonder about that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's going to be – and you know there's going to be news events happening uh, at the World Cup that will need that type of Always. level of coverage. So, uh, but I'll, I'll give Fox the opportunity, though. I mean, there's still plenty of time for them to kind of hire some additional people to strengthen that side of the, the, the business or form some uh, partnerships uh, kind of uh, – during the World Cup. So, so we'll have to wait and see on that one, though. But, but Kartik, I, I do think, uh, just to kind of uh, sum this up and, and just to kind of end on this note before we move on to other topics, is that it's almost as if Fox Sports now has to start from scratch, start from the beginning in terms of this World Cup coverage, because they have really been the rah-rah cheerleaders uh, for the U.S. men's national team, going back to, what, the Gold Cup, going back to Copa America, Centenario, just building up the hype so, so much, and then came crashing down. And, and now what are we left with? Now there's very little substance. And, and, I, and I think they really have to start from scratch. And today is the start of that. Uh, and we will see in the coming weeks and months uh, what happens and how that evolves. Yeah, I completely agree. And I, and I think... Also, going forward, hopefully the next four years, I don't know if Fox will think of it this way, but uh, they did a disservice to um, to the American fan and to, to, to the audience with their rah-rah, their, their lack of critical thinking. It created a bubble to the point where – and people who know me and people who follow me on Twitter say, oh, my God, he says the most outrageous things about me. He, he, he comments on the most controversial things, hot take uh, central, right? I instituted a policy starting in the, during the summer to not tweet or actually starting during the Mexico game, to not, uh, in, which is early summer, June, to not tweet at all during U.S. men's national team games. And it, to me, to a large extent, it was due to the culture that Fox had created, that any critical thought, any sort of analytical view of a U.S. men's national team game, even if it was a positive analytical view, was not uh, permitted. And it, it had become a fan base so diluted by, um, by, by, by this kind of insular, positive insular thinking, this group think, that uh, it, I just didn't even want to engage with the fan base. And those, again, who follow me on social media know um, I have a reputation for hot takes and outrageous statements about uh, various things, largely uh, soccer slash football related topics. Okay, Kartik, so uh, what else have you been watching uh, this past couple of weeks? And it, I, I guess we can't go through everything because there's so much, but uh, maybe just highlight some of the, the uh, interesting either matches or coverage that you, you saw that you think would be interesting uh, for yourself or for the listeners. Yeah, I um, watched the Dortmund Schalke game, which I, I would hope most people watched. Uh, I'm guessing they didn't. <laughs> I'm guessing they watched the Premier League, at least based on the numbers we've seen. Uh, I thought it very, very entertaining match. Uh, it was a uh, an opportunity for Fox to showcase the league. Now, of course, Fox uh, can't get away from the American theme with anything. So instead of this being the ultimate derby in German football between two big clubs, because uh, you and I have traveled from Chelsea Kirk to Dortmund uh, two weeks ago, actually, at this time, right? We were there end of November, beginning of December. Yeah. We've actually made the drive uh, about uh, 30 minutes, 45 minutes. It, it, it's uh, maybe a little more than that, maybe about an hour. It, it is a, a heated derby. It is one of the great derbies in European football um, and two of the best supported clubs on the continent. But, of course, Fox had to make the entire thing about Pulisic versus McKinney, right? It had to be about the Americans. Uh, but the game itself didn't disappoint. Now, Petter Bosch, really on the hot seat for Dortmund. I watched Dortmund the other day against Spurs before that uh, get beat, uh, have a 1-0 lead at halftime and get beat. Uh, Gets out to a 4-0 lead, really are flying, but continuing to play his high line, um, they get a man sent off, and it ends up being 4-4. A uh, really entertaining game. I, I have to take some uh, take take uh, issue with Stuart Holden claiming it was the best game in Europe. Find me a best game, uh, better game anywhere. He said it was the most entertaining game in Europe. It may be the most entertaining game of the European club season. That doesn't make it the best game. Dortmund's. Uh, inability to defend and Dortmund's inability to play uh, tactically the way their manager wants them to, playing a high line with, with uh, two center backs in particular, the full backs also, but the two center backs are not 
capable of playing uh, that way. And we saw this with Andre Villas-Boas when he went to uh, Chelsea, right? The same issue with playing a high line. Exactly. I, I think it makes it makes games very entertaining, but it doesn't necessarily make games um, – make the game a quality game uh that that having been said i enjoyed the game yeah it's uh actually finally i think the bundesliga finally had it had a game that lived up to its hype uh there's been so many occasions in the past before where we've had uh, derbies or big matches between say borussia dortmund and bayern munich and ends up being a nil nil tie and finally this was a game that that i think um if, if there's any any soccer fans out there that missed this one uh, try to go back and see if you can watch this one because it was very entertaining. Yes, defensively it was uh, weak, and in, in some ways we're not surprised with uh, Borussia Dortmund. Even the last couple of seasons, they've been pretty woeful in the back. Yeah. So entertaining going forward. But with Fox, too, focusing so much on uh, Pulisic and McKenney. I mean, McKenney, uh, Weston McKenney got substituted after 33 minutes for Schalke. So uh, not a good look uh, there for... Um, He's young, but but not a good look in terms of putting all your apples and and uh, focus on the American players. But uh, <laughs> it, it, it was quite an entertaining game. That's for sure. I just it, it, look. It's great that we had two Americans starting in a match of this caliber. Uh, it doesn't happen very often. But I mean, re- really, a, a derby of this stature between these two clubs. You're making all about two young American players. I. Um, uh, and I know there are going to be listeners who call in and say, oh, that's what happens in every country. I, I, I think Fox really puts, pushes it beyond um, recognition. And Fox now hasn't changed your ret- rhetoric or tone with this sort of thing, even since the U.S. Uh, missed qualifying for the World Cup. Um, so, I, and, I, and I think they're doing a disservice not only to the viewers, but I think they're doing a disservice to a lot of the people around uh, the American game because there, there's um, – I've complained often, Chris, about a sense of delusion, a, a sense of, uh, uh, of not quite understanding the United States' place in this global game. And, I, and a lot of that to me comes from Fox because – just the tone they set. And again and, – Anything they cover, they have to they have to go in that direction, and it, yeah. it's unfortunate. And, and that's their style. I mean, that's their shtick. I mean, that's that's they're all American all the way through. Uh, rubs a lot of people the wrong, the wrong way. A lot of other people enjoy it and like it, um, but they're not going to change, unfortunately. I mean, that's their thing. It was interesting, uh, Kartik, just as an aside too, because we did uh, on uh, was it Wednesday? Uh, I did the. Um, uh, media conference call uh, with Telemundo, where Telemundo Deportes was uh, previewing their World Cup coverage, and uh, we'll get more into that in a little bit later. But uh, I asked the question, as the first question I asked, uh, I said, okay, how is this going to differentiate from Fox's plans? And uh, without mentioning Fox, they said that uh, ours will be more authentic. And I think that's a good description of how I feel when I watch other broadcasters. It feels more honest, more authentic. Um, again, we'll get more into that probably in the letters section where, where we have a whole bunch of mailbag uh, comments and, and comments from the readers about the uh, interview we did with Alexi Lalas. But, uh, but, but let's move on to, to what else uh, stands out for you from the yeah. last couple of weeks. I've watched a lot of Bundesliga the last few weeks. Uh, I, w- I want to point out, uh, I think Keith Costigan has really come into his own. He's been yeah. at this a long time. And, and – uh, He's been at it, I think, since he played for the Portland Timbers. I mean, I remember when he played, I'm, I'm one of the few people who's uh, covered and watched U.S. lower division soccer going back to that era when Costigan uh, was playing with Portland. But uh, he, he's a guy that um, I think has gotten better and better, more sh- uh, sharper as an analyst and more seasoned as a commentator. So uh, he's now able to present, he's able to host, he's able to give the kind of analysis. He's watched now enough Bundesliga where he can throw an analysis on things like uh, uh, the, the Bayern match uh, against Mucin Gladbach the other day, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, Without um, a whole lot of effort in terms of um, trying to force opinions and force points, and I, and I think he's very, very succinct in what he says, and his analysis is getting uh, better and better. So uh, in terms of Costigan, he's, he's been a Fox, uh, uh, Fox soccer guy, Fox now Fox uh, FS1, FS2, going back now about 13 years, 12, 13 years. I really hope they include him in the World Cup coverage. Uh, I think that would be a, uh, a great add uh, to their team. I, I, 
I realize he may not have the right accent, but um, hopefully uh, they include him because I think he's getting better and better as uh, time moves on. Yeah, his goal calls are great. I mean, I mean that's something I've noticed too in terms of uh, he, he's definitely been um, studying a lot uh, in terms of and, and getting a lot of match practice in terms of commentating. And uh, his style is, is spot on in terms of... Uh, you mean not talking too much um, and sounding like somebody that you'd, you'd want to listen to rather than somebody that just spouts out facts and trivia. Um, it, it adds to the game, and, and he does a good job. Yeah. Whoever he works with as co-commentator, uh, yeah, he has to be on the World Cup team. Or if he's a co-commentator, right? He can do both, which is, um, yeah. I think... A, a real uh, asset, and he can also be a reporter, as he was during the uh, the, the Denmark Republic of Ireland two leg tie, and, and uh, grab some uh, good post match interviews. Had, had an interview with Christian Eriksen. I think it was the only interview I saw with Christian Eriksen in, in English mm-hmm. after that spectacular game Eriksen had. Uh, poor Eriksen, of course, missed a sitter <laughs> against Leicester uh, this week, uh, but uh, you know, obviously at the international level, has had, had a great uh, great run of it recently. Uh, otherwise, I mean, I've just been watching uh, probably what everyone else has been watching. Valencia and, and Barcelona watched uh, uh, Champions League last week. Man City, Fire Nord, uh, Dortmund, Spurs. I uh, missed Europa League because I was traveling. Uh, so I missed Everton 1, Atalanta 5 <laughs> yeah, at Goodison. Uh, uh, Columbus, Toronto, obviously tried to watch uh, uh, as much of that as I, I, I didn't get to see the whole thing. I admit I was watching a college basketball game uh, by Miami Hurricanes, who I support, uh, uh, playing Minnesota in the ECC Big Ten Challenge, so I only watched a little bit of Columbus, Toronto. Uh, but um, the thing that has uh, uh, stood out for me, and uh, maybe this changes, and we're going to talk a little bit about Mark Clattenburg in, in the next uh, in the news section, but uh, the addition of Mark Clattenburg may have broken up a little bit of the monotony for NBC because Kyle Martino uh, now, we, we, we say a lot of positive things about Kyle Martino often as a commentator. I have to say, uh, it's even more of a, a loss now to me because a couple of weeks into him being off of NBC's coverage, I'm just not terribly interested in what's going on in the studio. I'm skipping their studio shows. So um, uh, bringing in a guy like Clantenberg who will have a different perspective, and uh, I love that he, he came out right away and said, hey, I got a call wrong last year. Um, I, I forgot which call it was. Contra- it was the Alexis Sanchez against Hull, Hull City call. Right. Um, he said, I got that wrong. I, I didn't see it right. Uh, I went and apologized to, to Marco Silva and to Hull City at halftime. Um, I, I love that honesty, and I think it adds another element to their studio. I didn't watch the Fan Fest. I was watching Schalke and, and Dortmund, and, and I tried to turn back and watch the, 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 the Fan Fest, and it was just inauthentic to me. So you talk about inauthentic uh, and contrived, so I, I just kept watching the Bundesliga on FS1, but um, I'm glad I'm glad Clattenburg has been added, and, and I know we'll get a little bit more into that in the uh, next segment. Yeah, so the Fan Festival, actually, I, I enjoyed, um, I think it's one of those things that if you were there, it was probably more exciting than what, what we saw on television. Uh, what we saw on television, the, the sound wasn't great, they did the You'll Never Walk Alone, they had kind of the... Uh, the Liverpool fans there singing it at the same time that it was happening at Anfield and you had a split screen. I think the idea was good, but um, the, the, the acoustics, well, the acoustics were bad, but also the singing was really bad on the uh, at the fan festival. So it sounded like just a whole bunch of people singing out of tune. Um, and they didn't have the backing track that like they do at Anfield. So it was it was kind of corny, but, but I, I like that um, NBC Sports is trying to mix things up a little bit. Uh, the Mark Clattenburg uh, edition, even on a temporary basis, I think that's a great ad. And uh, I think this fan festival um, will do a lot in terms of goodwill, in terms of uh, the New York audiences, uh, having a lot of the supporters clubs coming in. And, and that's a great uh, benefit to them, uh, working with, with NBC to, to be able to allow their fans to be at this event. But for the TV viewer, eh, it was okay. And I ended up having, I think, both on. I think I had the... Uh, the review derby on one set, and then on, on another monitor, I had the uh, the fan festival on, on at the same time. But uh, it, it was okay. I, I do like, actually, the last couple of weeks, um, NBC definitely has been trying to uh, mix things up, in addition to those two things I just mentioned. But um, there's been le- less Arlo White. Um, he hasn't been on two times a, a weekend like he normally is. Um, so we've had a lot more of the world feeds for the commentaries, which has been good. 
Uh, and again, I think in, it's important that um, we don't get too much all uh, our whites because sometimes it's, too much is not, <laughs> it's not good, to be honest with you. The, the other thing I have liked a lot too the last couple of weeks is the... Um, the, the bonus uh, material. So, uh, and this is something that NBC did, what, when it first started with the Premier League, which was kind of a, a new revelation at the time, but they'd show the game and then they have bonus coverage. So the game would, whatever game it was on, would end and there's still like five or ten minutes of another game that would have on. And uh, with a lot of the midweek matches and some of the matches uh, over the weekends, um, this type of, uh, which which Fox now copies and they do to that too, but... Um, it's great because you're watching a match, whether it's uh, Manchester City against Southampton, kind of the last few minutes of that, that game, and it's really exciting. And then you switch over to uh, a, another game that's, that's going on and, and vice versa. So I, I really think that adds to the entertainment, and especially with uh, a lot of these games being on NBC, Go- NBC Sports Gold, not every single fan is uh, subscribing to that. So it's a good way to still stay in touch and see what's happening in those other games that you may not have access to uh, the full 90 minutes. Um, I did watch the uh, Toronto-Columbus game. Um, not To me, not the most exciting game. I mean, yes, definitely the, the, atmosphere, the atmosphere in Toronto is great and uh, kind of cheering on and Josie scoring the goal against all odds w- with an injury, uh, but not, not the most entertaining game by any means. Um, the interesting thing to me out of this one, and it was just really one of the main reasons I, t- I tuned in, was one Columbus crew. Um, so it's going to be a big uh, loss to have them out of this uh, MLS Cup. But two is Don Garber was supposed to uh, give a, um, an interview uh, with Alexi Lalas, and it was going to be uh, pre-match. And supposedly there was uh, traffic delays, so he couldn't make it to the uh, pre-match, so he, he conveniently was not there. And then supposedly he was going to do it halftime, and he didn't do halftime. Uh, he was at the stadium, and I was waiting at the post-match to see if he'd do a post-match interview uh, with Lexi Lalas. So, you know, of course, Lalas and Stone to interview uh, Garber. That didn't happen either. So really disappointing, especially with uh, everything going on in terms of the, the World Cup disaster and uh, the uh, USSF, well, combined with that, but also the Columbus crew, Save the Crew, uh, movement and, and what's going on with that whole fiasco. But very disappointing from Don Garber that uh, either Don Garber or Fox uh, couldn't get it together to get him on air, even for you know, 10 minutes, five minutes, something. Uh, very disappointing. Uh, yeah. And the thing I'm finding is we were having some good conversations and people were open to discussions for five days a week, 10 days after the U.S. lost to Trinidad and Tobago, uh, and, and for maybe a day or two after the, the crew, the whole pre-court thing was announced. But since then, it seems those who are making the decisions, the powers that be in U.S. soccer and in Major League Soccer, are becoming more defensive, becoming more uh, unwilling to have uh, the conversation and take tough, tough questions and answer tough questions. So it, the, the Columbus crew situation is, is uh, incredible in the sense that Major League Soccer Soccer, which is generally you know, like them or, or, or dislike them, uh, irrespective of your ideology in terms of soccer and governance and, and personal preferences as far as how leagues should be structured, generally does the PR thing very well. Generally is very good at controlling the message. Generally is very um, deliberative in how information gets disseminated. And this Columbus thing has contradicted everything, uh, every narrative, every script they've tried to draw over the course of the last however many years. And it has been such a public relations disaster and nightmare. And it's one that now over a month after the initial leak, and the confirmation from pre-court, they still haven't been able to put the genie back into the bottle. And I, I think they're just um, they're digging deeper and deeper. And it, Garber would be wise at MLS Cup, which will be on uh, e, which is on ESPN this year. Um, That's right. To, to address uh, this matter, uh, otherwise they're going to have a whole off season of it festering. Yeah. And um, I think they, I think. It might be far gone for them. And again, the the point being, Chris, MLS, love them or hate them, 
I tend to not uh, uh, agree with many of their, their preferences for how they structure the sport in this country, but they are very good at the PR game typically. And this has been a disaster of uh, uh, unparalleled uh, proportions in, in the history of the league. Yeah, and, and the timing isn't good either because you've got, I mean, the U.S. Is, uh, um, the U.S. Uh, getting knocked out of the World Cup. You've got the Columbus Crew, crew situation. You've got the NASL antitrust uh, lawsuit against um, USSF, uh, which, I mean, it does involve MLS to, to some degree. And then you've got the, also the, uh, the CAS appeal, uh, where Kingston Stockade and Miami FC uh, appealed to the Court of Arbitration, which we still have to hear back from. So there's, there's a lot of things happening, um, and, and other things too. There's, it's just, just not those. But those are four major things that are happening all at the same time. And, and really, I mean, you think about it, Kartik. I mean, the U.S. Tr- uh, Trinidad and Tobago game, that was October 10th. So if Garber does come back out and says, I mean, he does the, um, the MLS Cup on December 9th, that's almost two, year, uh, two months after the actual uh, the U.S. gets knocked out, which there's big implications in terms of MLS. Uh, in regards to that too, and we'd love to get uh, Garber's viewpoints on on what he feels about that. But um, yeah, it's um, and, and at the end of the day, I mean, I mean, MLS is probably happy that Columbus Crew gets knocked out, and now they're hoping that 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 story will drop and there will be less exposure on that, and that everyone will start talking about Toronto and Seattle and Houston. Um, you mean and, and move move the narrative on. Uh, I don't think that's going to happen, but I think I'm sure that's what they're hoping. All right, Kartik, let's move on to TV streaming news. And I'll have you kick it off. Yeah, uh, so Premier League clubs will screen up to 210 live matches per season uh, in the new UK uh, deal that will uh, begin with the 2019-2020 season. Uh, it's uh, it's up from uh, about 170 to 180 now, uh, which means more games will be shown live in the United Kingdom, which is a positive. Uh, it also means Sky uh, might raise their rates even further for those of you before you get too excited about this. So we'll see how this plays out. Yeah, also it means, I mean, for U.S. viewers, so, so for the U.K. viewers, yeah, it's a, it's a big changes and it's, it's a good news in terms of having more games on television. Um, for the, us in the U.S. And, and around the world, really, but U, U.S. specifically, it also means that there may be a Saturday night live match uh, on the cards, uh, which would equate to about a 3 p.m. Eastern kickoff. So an additional game uh, that would be played. So you, ha- you have your 10 games uh, every weekend, but uh, here's an opportunity to actually have one at a 3 p.m. kickoff time, which would be now- 8 o'clock UK time. Now, this will be interesting because this puts you right head to head with uh, during the first part of the uh, uh, the the season, uh, Premier League season with college football in the United States. Uh, if Notre Dame is playing a home game, it automatically takes the game off of NBC, off of NBC over the air. Uh, and uh, for the second half of the season puts you up head to head with uh, with the potential of uh, uh, PGA Tour events, uh, college basketball, um, uh, maybe an NBA game, uh, but mostly college basketball and the third round of, of PGA Tour events. So that's um, that's something to be cognizant of and, and, and see how the ratings are. Because you have people who defend, Chris, Major League Soccer's ratings by saying, well, the Premier League doesn't compete with anything. Well, the Premier League competes with something called early morning and sleeping and youth soccer, uh, uh, just family life in general, I think, more than MLS's. Uh, time slots, but um, you know we'll see now because it'll, there'll be some genuine competition at, yeah. at that time slot. Yeah, soccer-wise, uh, this would compete with La Liga, like usually the two forty-five Eastern Time game, as well as Serie A to, le- yeah. to a lesser extent. But also Major League Soccer. I mean, Major League Soccer often on a, on a Saturday you'll have a four p.m. kickoff, and a lot of those games are on Univision. So that's uh, more competition for MLS on top. And, of and WSL as well, uh, four yeah. p.m. on much time. That's true. That's true. All right, so moving on, um, this week at a sports business journal conference, uh, MLS Commissioner Don Garber poured cold water on the potential of a U.S. model of promotion relegation by saying it would be a lot of fun for fans, but impossible to manage regarding media rights, stadium financing, player union issues, etc. Now, historically speaking, I think Garber, going, you can go back over a decade, I think it's mentioned probably like three or four times at least that, yeah, yeah, I can see pro- promotion relegation happening at some time in the future, distant future. Um, and obviously, whenever the topic is brought up, is it's either kind of pushed, yeah, yeah, sometime in the future. Or in this case, he's saying that it's, uh, 
it's impossible uh, to, because it's uh, managing uh, media rights. Now, Kartik, what do you think about uh, this? W- what is he alluding to when he says that uh, media TV rights would be a, an issue specifically um, if they did uh, bring in re- a promotion relegation? I, I don't know. I have no idea what he's talking about, unless he's thinking in a very closed American mind, or he's concerned that, again, this is uh, um, the, the field that they'll throw out. The L.A. teams and the New York teams could all get relegated, and you could have a team from Chattanooga and a team from uh, uh, from Tulsa and a team from uh, uh, from uh, Charleston in the first division, and the TV rights would go down. I, I guess that's what he's alluding to, but again um, – you know, pro rel systems. I mean, one one critique I have of the English system is that the English system, to me, has has favored clubs since 1992, since the Premier League breakaway, has favored clubs that are in bigger markets and in richer areas. Meaning, to me, that a pro rel open system would probably be even better for the clubs in LA and New York and in um, uh, other areas that are wealthier, the San Francisco Bay Area, etc., and, and where there's a high population concentration. I don't know what he's talking about. He's making excuses. Um, there's thought, there's there's various um, theories that they throw against the wall to try and push back against ProRel at various times, right? You've noticed this, Chris. It's not, they're, their pushback against the idea of an open open system or promotion or relegation is never consistent. Um, they'll, they'll blame the other side, a lot of the, the, the MLS proponents, for being inconsistent, but they're very inconsistent because they're always looking for little grains of evidence in uh, the way leagues operate abroad, uh, football leagues operate abroad, or uh, uh, American professional leagues operate here domestically to, to justify uh, opposition to promotion and relegation. I assume he means you might have the wrong teams uh, in the first division, thus weakening the television rights profile. I, I don't know. I mean, is he saying you can't have a unified television deal for all leagues under a promotion and relegation scheme? That, that we know is not true. We see from overseas... Right. That's not the case with the football league, the EFL now, as it's known, uh, for, for instance. Uh, that, that's the first one that comes to mind. Is he talking specifically about um, the, um, the willingness of the current television partners of Soccer United Marketing and, and the United States Soccer Federation? Because, again, they're the ones who handle the contract. Uh, is he talking about their willingness to uh, invest in a league with promotion and relegation? I, I find that kind of hard to believe, considering those partners have all invested in other leagues that have promotion and relegation and have, in fact, played up the drama of promotion and relegation fights uh, to the point where Fox uh, even showed the, the, the promotion and relegation playoff from Germany last right. year. Yeah. Um, so I don't know what he's talking about. It, yeah, it, to, to me, it sounds like just a whole bunch of excuses just to kind of um, you mean try to move the topic on to something else and just say, okay, here's a whole bunch of things that could uh, be issues, and let's move on to the next topic, so, so to speak, uh, without going into any any detail regarding those. So, um, yeah, I think it's just kind of a uh, trying to avoid the topic um, or just try to tiptoe around the topic, just you mean, name a whole bunch of things and then then, then move on. Speaking of moving on, Kartik, what, what, what else? What other news do we have? Yeah, so the, we've talked a little bit about the uh, Nations League, which uh, uh, UEFA is going to uh, have starting in, in uh, September 2018. Well, now CONCACAF has announced uh, their their League of Nations, a year-round unified competition platform for all 41 confederation national teams, which will create even more competitive matches for each of the CONCACAF members. It's good for the smaller countries. I don't know how good it is for the U.S. and Mexico and uh, Costa Rica, um, Honduras, the elite countries in, in CONCACAF, but... Uh, uh, another competition, and the way this works is that it's played in lieu of friendly. So the thing this will do, unfortunately, it was already going to happen because of the European Nations League uh, and the the loss of a lot of friendly dates on the calendar for UEFA members. Uh, but now these uh, many friendlies you've seen the United States play in Europe uh, over the course of the last uh, uh, decade, They're starting with the tenure of Bob Bradley when, when he took the team to Poland and he took the team to Spain and to England. I went to the game at Wembley, U.S.-England, uh, on, on typical friendly dates. Uh, those now will be replaced by Nations League games, both for the UEFA participants and, and for the U.S. That could be a setback, though, too, for, uh, for Nations. I mean, like, so if you're just playing within your own region and the level of play within that region isn't as great as, as other regions around the world, um, whether it's you know, South America or, or wherever, is that you're playing against similar teams – 
uh, instead of playing against tougher opposition. So same, yeah. th- same thing for the European teams to, to some extent too, depending on uh, who they end up playing. I, mean, I, I guess it all depends where you're from and who you're playing, but uh, it could be a concern and actually could uh, hurt some national programs, included in the, the United States. Yeah, certainly. Okay, so speaking of the, the new 2019-2022 Premier League deal that we spoke about a few minutes ago in the UK where Sky Sports and BT Sports are expected to uh, start the bidding process next year. There's been a lot of discussion that Amazon could be interested in putting in a bid given that they just secured a deal to get the US Open rights in the UK and paid approximately $40 million uh, for those. So Amazon from time to time has been mentioned, but uh, they did secure a deal for a major tennis tournament uh, in the UK, uh, for, the, for the UK audiences. And uh, who knows? I mean, they're already doing Thursday night football. So who knows if they'd uh, throw their hat in the ring for uh, the Premier League in the UK. Now, that's not going to have an impact on the US. Uh, NBC has their deal through, I think, 2022, I think it is. Um, but still, it's, it'll be interesting to watch and see what uh, Amazon does uh, overseas and if they do put in a bid for the Premier League. Yeah, um, we talked last uh, earlier today about Mark Lattenberg joining NBC Sports to uh, boost its Premier League coverage, and I think already in Week One he's done a uh, a fantastic job. Uh, he is working as uh, a referee in Saudi Arabia currently. Their season is uh, they're on a little bit of a different calendar than uh, than European leagues, so uh, he'll be back and forth. But it, from the sound of it, he'll be in. Uh, in Stanford ever so often to give some analysis. Yeah, I, I think uh, as with Dr. Joe, I mean, Dr. Joe, I like to take in very small d- doses in terms of when he's on all the time, I just get sick of him. But uh, now and again, when when the situation calls for it, when there's a, a critical call and then he shares his, uh, his input or his, uh, his knowledge, it's helpful. And the same thing with Mark Clattenburg, too. If he was there every week, we probably would get sick of him pretty soon. But he is going to be out there on a temporary basis, and we'll be um, providing some analysis uh, to help out the crew. Actually, going back to what you said earlier, Kartik, I didn't get a chance to um, mention it. But uh, for me, I, I'm definitely missing uh, Carl Martino in terms of his coverage and his analysis on NBC. But I think the two Robbies have, have done a great job um, Again, it's a smaller studio set, um, less people. I mean, they usually don't have the two Robbies and Kyle uh, there anymore. Um, but uh, and for me, the two Robbies have been great. So let's move on. Uh, another news uh, point is that uh, ESPN announced this week that they've had uh, layoffs with 150 jobs being eliminated. Uh, this is uh, in, a, in a process of, of several layoffs that they had, they've had over the last couple of years. ESPN has told us that their policy is not to announce which employees are affected. Instead, they leave it to each individual employee to decide whether or not they want to make the information public or not. But uh, according to a source that spoke to Will Soccer Talk, none of the ESPN FC crew were affected. So that's good news. Yeah, that's very, very good news. And the show uh, continues to roll on. Gal Marcotti actually uh, in Bristol this week, which is a, a welcome change to have him on the couch. Uh, Rebecca Lowe will be uh, NBC's daytime host for the Winter Olympics in February, as she was in 2014, uh, when uh, after NBC, their first year of covering the Premier League. So she won't be able to do the Premier League live coverage uh, that month or during the course of the, the Winter Olympics. Uh, we've reached out uh, to find out from NBC who the temporary replacement for Rebecca Lowe will be while she's away, but um, the network isn't ready to make an announcement. Could it be Steve Bauer or Arlo White like last time? Could they borrow Sebastian Salazar uh, from uh, ESPN? He obviously has had a relationship with NBC and, and Comcast in the past. Uh, I guess we'll have to wait and find out. Okay, and last but not least, uh, so I had that conference call this week with uh, Telemundo Deportes. Uh, they went into more detail in terms of their World Cup coverage. Uh, we have an article at worldsoccertalk.com that goes into a lot more detail. But uh, the, the summary is, is that out of the 64 games uh, in the World Cup next summer, 56 of them are going to be live on Telemundo, uh, the over-the-air network, uh, which is available across the United States. Um, of the eight games that they're not going to be showing, those eight games are going to be live on Universo. And uh, the reason that those eight are on Universo is because um, at, at certain times, usually at the end of the, uh, the group stage, um, and uh, I think, well, yeah, I think it's the end of the group stage usually, is that you have games playing, 
being played concurrently. So they can't have two games on Telemundo at once. So they would have the, one of the games on Telemundo and then the other game on uh, Universo. Uh, in addition to that, um, I believe that all of the commentators, uh, or actually the vast majority, if not all of them, will be commentating uh, from the stadiums in Russia. I need to get some clarification on that just to make sure. But uh, in terms of the talent that they'll have, uh, some of the names just to throw out there, uh, Carlos Hermosillo, uh, who does a lot of the, of the Premier League coverage and is, is quite good indeed. Uh, Juan Pablo Angel, which a lot of our listeners will know from his days at Aston Villa and uh, also the New York Red Bulls. And uh, Manuel Sol, uh, Rolando Fonseca, uh, Claudio Borgi, and, uh, and many, many more. But Basically, my takeaway from this was that uh, Telemundo is going all in in terms of their coverage. They're planning to have an average of 17 hours a day of World Cup coverage um, on their networks. So, yeah, so there's only like, what, seven hours uh, of uh, non-World Cup related uh, programming that will be on. Um, so that's that's a, a huge undertaking. I also did ask them, too, if they're planning on making any cuts uh, or have made any um, any other changes with the U.S. men's national team not making it into the World Cup, um, as Fox has done. Fox has kind of pulled back a little bit on their initial plans, uh, and Telemundo didn't answer the question directly, but they uh, it sounded like uh, there wasn't going to be any major changes, and most of the teams that they're going to be probably getting the most, the, the largest numbers of, of viewers uh, are going to be, you mean, the Mexico's and... Uh, Uruguay's and Argentina's of the world anyway, so I don't think it's going to impact them as much, uh, but all in all, uh, Telemundo's sounding very positive. All right, context. so let's move on to uh, TV ratings and um, actually let, let me go ahead and play a clip. So this is uh, something that uh, we have an article about at worldsoccertalk.com and we have the full clip on there, so we'll just play a portion of it. But uh, it was a recent um, symposium that was held uh, in the Northeast, and uh, Taylor Twelman was invited, and he spoke about um, TV ratings. And then, let me play the clip, and then we can talk about it. So here goes. Here's the, the interesting thing about this discussion, and it drives me a little nuts on it. God, it only took me 25 minutes to get ready to do a rant. Um, is everyone in this room will probably look me in the face and say that Barcelona, Real Madrid gets five to six million viewers in our country. That is unequivocally false. People will then tell me that Manchester United, Chelsea outrate Columbus and New York City ten times. That's false. I don't think people fully understand the viewership number or what is that number. When Stoke City plays Southampton, I'm just telling you guys, it's 300 to 400,000 people. When Columbus played New York City Tuesday night, it was 430,000 people. But nobody in the soccer world wants to hear that because they're like, oh, why would anyone watch that crap? There's no pro rel. There's no, none of this. And you're like, wait, wait a minute. Numbers don't lie. People do. Let me read it. Like that. Numbers don't lie, people do. All right, Kartik. So he goes into a lot more uh, depth in terms of talking about Liga MX, talking about MLS TV ratings on ESPN, um, etc. But what's your initial um, thoughts in terms of what you just heard? Yeah, I mean, I think that there are uh, at times very positive signs for uh, MLS. I mean, I think uh, certainly the, the number that he's referencing, the um, the Columbus NYCFC game, uh, was a was a fantastic number, and it was something that if you are a um, an MLS fan, you're going to get excited about, right? And you're, and you're going to be shouting uh, to the mountains about because I, I think this is the thing. I mean, MLS MLS fans tend to take a lot of these numbers in isolation, take them out of context, and then say, well, look, as many people watch this game as, as uh, an average Premier League game or far more watch this than watch the Bundesliga or watch uh, La Liga or whatever. Uh, but again, that's when you selectively – pull out a game, which is what uh, he did here. I think um, there has been a positive upturn because of Columbus, as you mentioned in the first segment of the show today, and, and uh, Columbus games almost have to be taken as, as a separate um, separate set now. Like an outlier. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, there have been so many of them in the playoffs. They're not necessarily outliers. But I think you have to look at a Columbus average and a non-Columbus average if, if you want to look at the playoffs. And if you do that and you look at uh, the games that don't include Columbus, the ratings are still nowhere near the average Premier League game. Yeah, that, that, that's my biggest criticism in terms of what Tw- uh, Twelman said there, too, is kind of comparing a uh, Stoke against Southampton and saying you know, 300,000 people watching that game. Uh, which is which is true. It's probably that's a, uh, a typical kickoff, a, a typical uh, viewing number for a, you mean a seven thirty game or, or a ten o'clock in the morning game, and then comparing that to Columbus against Toronto, that's been shown in prime time on ESPN uh, on a weeknight when there's probably very little competition, and you have the Columbus Crew in terms of uh, everything that's been going for them this season, a lot of controversy, but pulling in a lot of viewers that normally would not watch uh, Columbus and kind of hoping that they do well. Uh, It's an unfair comparison in many ways. And and I think it's, I mean, yes, it's a good number. I mean, that Columbus-Toronto number is fantastic. And and we hope to see bigger numbers like like that too. But uh, I think it just this comparison was a bit off. We're averaging Premier League matches, I think average about uh, 450,000 viewers. Uh, which is down uh, a little bit, but still, it's it's a decent number, and that's an average, and that's that includes the Stoke and Sa- Southamptons, includes the the Swansea, Bournemouth, as well as the Man United, Newcastle's, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But um, for listeners who are interested, I definitely go to the website, to the homepage, WorldSoccerTalk.com. It does go into a lot more detail, and he does talk about so- some other things too. And it's one of those things that I think um, I would have loved to be, have been at the uh, symposium to hear the entire speech. Um, and, and maybe he went into greater detail later that wasn't on the video. Um, so I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. But, um, I mean, kind of disappointed in terms of just uh, Twelman's, um, what he said. The, the other thing, too, I think in many ways, I, I don't know if he's responding to people on Twitter or these people that say that you know, Barcelona, Real Madrid, or Barcelona, uh, Valencia would get five million viewers and that the viewership for the Premier League is ten times as much as, as the uh, as, as Major League Soccer. I'm not sure where he's getting that from. And if it is Twitter, you know, I mean, that's probably uh, not the best place to go to for uh, – to, to hear there, opinions like that. There are some real misrepresentations out there uh, offered by anti-MLSP. Yeah, I'll say that, of television ratings. I do hear that all the time. Oh, the Premier League gets 10 times as many viewers as MLS in the U.S. No, it doesn't. Uh, let's be – but but there is a gap, right? So let's not let – the, the defense then of, of people who are – poor of MLS will be that, oh, more people are watching or more people are actually interested uh, in in the teams, which is nonsense. The Garber once said that, that uh, there were more people actually interested in Major League Soccer than in the Premier League, when in fact, I mean, I think the the intensity of the people watching um, the the leagues, the 500,000 who watch the Premier League really engaged in the league, the way NFL fans are uh, in this uh, country. The way the the, uh, 300 or so thousand are watching MLS games, to 300,000, or many of them are just casuals. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's move on to listener mail- mailbag. And uh, we had a lot of feedback uh, from the interview we did with Alexi Lalas. If you missed that one, definitely go back and listen to it. Uh, whether you love him or hate him, uh, I-, I think it'll give you an appreciation of uh, who he is. Um, so, some of the feedback we got the-, the first one is from the Soccer Heretic uh, from Twitter. And he says, uh, I made time to listen to this uh, interview with Alexi Lalas today when I normally don't get to the, the, the new part until a few days later. I am so sick of hearing Alexi talk about being a performer. It's a cop-out. He mentions ratings and what works, what, what works, but Fox's ratings are dumpster fire. His performance isn't successful by any measurement. He's not accurate. Uh, his predictions are rarely successful. Ratings are terrible. His performance has become America's Sock TV's biggest troll job at best description. He's not creating viewers with his uh, creating of controversy. He's harming him and his network's credibility. Edwin uh, uh, Husino also hosted on Twitter. He says, uh, Alexi Lalas was awesome, and you guys gave him very hard questions. Loved it. Random Black Rain on Twitter says, um, and after listening to the podcast and hearing what he said, Alexi Lalas shouldn't be within a mile of any USSF debate. A debate isn't a shoutcast or a PTI ripoff. Josh Linville on Twitter said, uh, I was dismayed by the, performan- uh, by the performer comments and tone as well. I don't tune in to be entertained the same way I would a sitcom or reality show. 
I want to be informed first. I want critical thinking and nuance. Great pod, though, and glad to see you three making time for each other. And lastly, Trevor Hood, uh, through Twitter, uh, said, have you considered putting together a piece outlining, outlining the various power players and their relationship to help us better understand what's at play in U.S. soccer going forward? Able to piece some, uh, some together from the podcast, but those politics uh, mostly unknown to the average fan. And we got a whole bunch of other comments, too. Uh, we didn't have time to read them out on air, but there's kind of a sampling, some, some positive, some negative. Um, any, any thoughts on that one, Kartik? Yeah, I, I think the thing that the takeaway from the, the interview we did with Lawless, uh, with some hindsight and the, uh, the ability to see how folks to it on Twitter was uh, his assertion that he's an entertainer, that he's a performer. And that's something that goes on in news divisions, for example, all over the country. Uh, but news uh, television, uh, the local channels, and cable news channels, be it CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, whoever, is the role of the presenter and the host and the commentator that's sitting at that desk to inform or is it to entertain? And – for better or for worse, the lawless view of things is becoming more and more commonplace in American television. Now, I don't think that's the way this sport, football, is football, soccer, whatever you prefer to call it, is necessarily presented in Europe, where a lot of the people who, um, look to for inspiration, a lot of people who watch uh, soccer in this country, and uh, – that's where their personal preference is to have a much more informative uh, type uh, type setting. That having been said, I have to say, when I watch uh, the way Sky Sports News covers, and that, that's a sister company of Fox's, uh, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, covers the Premier League, at times there's a lot of shouting, there's a lot of uh, wind-up going on. They're not the BBC. Right. Um, yeah. And so we have to remember that. Uh, my preference is for someone who informs and is analytical and is talking about tactics, which is why I, one of the reasons I've been so critical of Fox over the years, and I generally enjoy watching the ESPN FC show because uh, I'm going to get that sort of analysis from uh, the guys on the couch there, from, from uh, Shaka Hislop and Craig Burley and Alejandro Moreno, and Dan Thomas is going to ask, uh, or Seb Salazar is going to ask the type of questions that I, wanna, I want answered, and that doesn't happen on Fox. But I respect that there is – this isn't just a soccer thing. There is a drift towards the type of um, uh, presentation Fox gives and Lala is, is advocating or, or claiming he's fitting into uh, across the board in, in television in the United States and even in the United Kingdom to a large extent. Yeah, Sky Sports definitely is uh, is pretty fake in terms of their coverage. Um, I've watched quite a lot of that and even just the whole transfer deadline day thing is – it's oh, a, soap, a soap opera. I mean, it's a joke. Um, but, but, but to me, I mean, um, most of the listeners probably, I, I think at this point, myself included, now I know where Lalas is coming from. And there's some listeners that already knew that in terms of kind of his, his spiel. But he is what he is, and, and, that's, and, that, and, that's, and he's not, he's not uh, ashamed of it, but he, he sees himself as an entertainer. And that's what he does. My issue is, is that I, I don't know when he's being honest and authentic and when he's not. And um, that was one of the things that rubbed me the wrong way, Kartik, after that interview. And it still does to this day. But him saying during the interview with us, he said that uh, you, uh, Chris and Kartik, you guys are putting on an act. And I'm like, this is us. I mean, Kart Kartik, you and I, we're doing this podcast right now. If you caught us at a pub or a bar or, or on the street, we'd be having the same conversations. We would be ha saying the same types of things. We're not putting on an act. We're just saying what we believe from our hearts and um, take it for what it is. I mean, we're, we're not on television. Um, maybe that's the difference between us and, and kind of Alexi Lalas, but that rubbed me the wrong way. And to me, um, I have respect for Alexi in terms of his intelligence. I don't have respect in terms of uh, the entertainment style of things because it is uh, inauthentic. Yeah. All right, so let's move on. Uh, some more comments and, and uh, feedback from the listeners. And uh, next one is from Nuke uh, via Twitter. He says, one thing I've noticed on the Fox broadcast recently is the slow-mo skill cam. I like it. I don't recall BN or NBC having that type of view. 
And uh, yes, I've noticed that too. So they've, they've definitely improved uh, the technology and software that they're using for some of the slow-mo stuff. And, I, and I'm sure we'll see more and more of that during the World Cup. Uh, Rob Keith sent us in through email. He says, I was watching the uh, CSKA Moscow Benfica match on ESPN3, and they didn't superimpose the score and time on the screen. I've noticed that Fox Match Pass does the same thing for Champions League fixtures, and I'm curious why that is. As far as I can tell, those networks don't do that for other competitions. Also, I've been out of the loop the past... Well, actually, let me answer that one first. Um, so he... A lot of the, especially for the international feeds, uh, especially the Champions League especially, um, Fox oftentimes picks up the, the feed from Sky Sports uh, rather than the world feed. So uh, Europa League is one example. Europa League, well, this is going back probably about eight years ago, um, the commentary from the world feed was absolutely awful. I, it was some of the worst commentary I've ever heard, and this is a whole bunch of English commentators that were hired, and, and I still, I'm sure, probably uh, in work doing, doing what they do, but the commentaries were horrible. So at that time, Fox decided, okay, let's switch to the Sky Sports and have the Sky Sports commentators do, doing uh, the games. What happens, though, is when they pull in that feed is that you've got the Sky Sports graphics on the screen, and sometimes in the, in the top corner, if you're watching this in England, you'd have graphics popping up, you know, like saying... I don't know, 10 days to go until the Sky Sports special marathon on, or whatever it is. So that's, what, that's the reason that they do that. They're, um, they're taking the Sky Sports feed so you have a better commentary, uh, but at the same time they have to strip the, the screen bare of any types of graphics so you don't see the clock oftentimes and uh, you don't see the score line and you don't see any top uh, graphics uh, usually in the top right corner. Um, they'll just put the ESPN graphics in there or the Fox graphics, whoever's picking that up. Uh, Rob Keith goes on to say, I've been out of the loop the past few weeks, and I'm not sure if you brought it up, but Fox Soccer Match Pass is now available on Roku and Apple TV, which I'm very excited about. I end up watching a lot of matches on delay, and this uh, simplifies watching soccer. Thanks for everything you do, uh, Rob, from Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, a place that should be getting an MLS team pretty soon, uh, knock on wood. Um, yeah, yeah, Fox so Soccer Match Pass, I think we discussed it in a, a previous episode, uh, but if we haven't, yes, it is now on Roku and Apple TV, uh, finally, after all these years. And yeah, then, and uh, by the yeah. way, Nashville, Nashville will have a USL team next season. That's right, that's right. So next up is Lennon Fierro, and he sent this in through email. He says, uh, hi, guys, I enjoy your show, and I'm not an avid listener. That's okay. Uh, but when I catch it, I definitely enjoy it. I just wanted to drop you a line about you guys pandering to that Chelsea FC fan on your last show, crying for a mention of his team. And on top of that, he was throwing you some underhanded insult. But I just digress. I wanted to have your take about the Florida Cup. It looks like there are some good teams uh, participating, especially the ones from South America. Uh, yeah, yeah. I actually uh, last season got to call a game in the Florida Cup, uh, uh, a, a, the game that was played here in Fort Lauderdale for um, for Fox Soccer Match Pass. Actually, I think it was uh, it was heard on Fox Soccer Match Pass and, and Fox uh, Sports International, uh, some of the Fox Sports uh, affiliates uh, around the world. So our News Corp companies. So yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, the Florida Cup. I've been involved the last few years. I've mentioned calling that game last year, the previous year. Uh, worked with uh, Florida Cup and with the Fort Lauderdale Strikers. Uh, Schalke played Schalke. I was involved in. Uh, I think Chris, you came out to see uh, Shakhtar play uh, in the Florida Cup, and Schalke played uh, as well. So, um, yeah, looking forward to the tournament this year. Rangers is coming over, which um, it's not Rangers of old, but I know the organizers are excited about because there were a lot of Rangers fans still in pockets here in the state of Florida. Uh, PSV is going to be coming over, uh, and they're going to they're they're going to be playing uh, their matches. Uh, they're not going to be staying for the whole month because they've got to get back uh, after the winter break in, in uh, Holland, but they're going to be coming over, uh, as well as a couple of Brazilian clubs, uh, Fluminense once again. Uh, just actually had a meeting about Fluminense uh, today before we recorded this podcast about their uh, participation in the Florida Cup this year. Corinthians is coming over. Uh, Barcelona from Ecuador is coming over again, and I cannot remember the other clubs. Uh, there are a few that I'm missing. Legia uh, from Poland is coming over, and then a few other clubs from South America. So it should be should be a really exciting tournament. I'm, as always, looking forward to it and uh, uh, hoping I'll be involved in some capacity, as I have been the last few seasons. 
So speaking of Chelsea, I did forget to mention in uh, the what we've been watching section is I watched the Chelsea Liverpool match or Liverpool Chelsea match, and uh, for most of the listeners who uh, who don't know. Um, I, I'm a cord cutter. I've cut the cords, I think, several months ago. And um, the challenging one is, is always the NBC game at 12.30 on Saturdays if I don't have the rabbit ears set up. But I did learn something new, and that is with Fubo, uh, I have a subscription to the Chelsea TV channel, and I have a subscription to the uh, Universo uh, through Fubo. So I'm able to actually watch the game on Universo and then turn down the volume so I don't have to listen to the Spanish commentary. And then in a different window, uh, launch uh, Chelsea TV on Fubo, and they have the radio commentary of the game. And I'm I'm able to sync that up pretty easily because they have clocks on both of them, both the Chelsea uh, radio commentary and the match itself, of course. And I'm actually able to sync that up and listen to English commentary of a a match that's uh, on Spanish-language television. And it worked out really, really well. All righty, just to show that I'm not a Chelsea hater by any means. Uh, last but not least, uh, Jason Ryder, uh, through email, he said, uh, Hello, this is Jason in Virginia. I have enjoyed watching free Manchester City highlights on their official website for years now. Are there any hints to them having a streaming service to show full games, whether it's a paid service or not? My other comment is that I have enjoyed uh, having the Football League on ESPN3 service this year. It is by far the best. Uh, it's by far the soccer I have watched the most in the past few months. Um, the answer to that, Jason, is to somehow get YES on your uh, the YES network, the Yankees network uh, cable system. Yeah. That's the way to do it in the U.S. Which which you can get through Fubo. I know that, and uh, so that through there you get a lot of the highlights of um, Manchester City television. Or you get everything. Yeah, they'll show this. Sh- Full game once or twice again during the course of the week. You get a lot of the Manchester City TV features. Um, in fact, I think YES might have a daily show, half an hour show that's produced by City TV that they, that they put in. Now, obviously, during baseball season, um, it's tougher to find these things, but uh, the period of time that we're entering now, where the Premier League is ongoing and there's no baseball, uh, YES is loaded with Manchester City content. Okay, and then uh, his comments about the uh, ESPN3 and, and the, the championship, which actually they've been showing a lot of League 1 and League 2 games recently too, when, especially during the international breaks. I agree with Jason. Um, I just haven't had a chance to watch as much championship or football league matches as I would like, just because there's so much going on and so many different matches to choose from. But uh, it is an intriguing championship season by far. So I'm going to try to probably watch some more over the holidays. It is, and I'm going to say this. I mean, I've gotten to the point where um, there are a few weeks that have gone by now again where I haven't watched any of those games on ESPN3. But I'm just thinking as the promotion race heats up, I'm going to be watching so much ESPN in, in March and April because of uh, um, the, the push and, and games that we never used to get on BN. So yeah. the, the best is yet to come, I think, from the Football League being on ESPN3. Yeah, yeah, yeah. D- definitely more games than ever before. So if you do have any feedback, comments, questions uh, about anything on the show or questions that you have about watching soccer on TV, online, or apps, uh, send us an email to web at worldsoccertalk.com. You can tweet us at... W Soccer Talk, or hit us up on Facebook and send us a message there through facebook.com slash World Soccer Talk. Now, let's move on to our feature topic of the week. And uh, for the second week in a row, our second podcast in a row, we have an exclusive interview. This one is with Rocco Camiso, who's the uh, New York Cosmos chairman and owner. And Kartik, um, how about you go ahead and kind of uh, give a little bit of a, a teaser um, into this interview before we go ahead and, and hit play? Yeah, we're going to talk a little bit with Rocco Camiso uh, about, uh, obviously, there's an ongoing litigation between uh, his league, the NASL, and the U.S. Soccer Federation, but also about television and media-specific properties. Uh, Mr. Camiso has an extensive background, 30 years, in the uh, television and media business, Uh, is the... uh, the founder of Mediacom, which is one of the largest uh, cable providers uh, in the country, uh, one of the largest media companies in the country, and uh, we, we're going to talk a lot about that. In addition, let me uh, mention to our listeners that there will be much more content uh, from Rocco Camiso. He was very generous with his time, Chris, with you and I. We, we uh, uh, spent about 
almost uh, two hours on record with him talking about various things. So this is one portion of it related to, to media, uh, but there is uh, much more to come that you can look for at worldsoccertalk.com in the next uh, five to seven days. Yeah, definitely. And, and just for this interview too, it's, uh, we've taken the excerpts out of it. Some of the, uh, the most intriguing things that he had said, and like Kartik said too, um, there'll be follow-up uh, articles and uh, possibly more audio available to listen to some of the other things he had to say, because there was a lot to cover um, at a crucial time in terms of um, the history of NASL, the New York Cosmos, and, and U.S. soccer. So let's go ahead and play the interview with Rocco Camiso. So, so there's a $4 billion, soon after that, $4 billion offer reportedly by MP and Silva and, and uh, Ricardo Silva, who you know, who's a, co, who's a fellow NASL owner, Miami FC fellow, uh, you know, also Italian, um, to impose a, uh, a pro rel structure in the top three divisions of U.S., uh, of, of what would be U.S. soccer, but uh, with MLS at the top. And uh, involving MLS in a pro rel structure, it was rejected. We talked at length, Chris, on this podcast about that, uh, thinking it was very short-sighted of M- by MLS and very uh, ill-advised. Um, what's your take, Rocco, on why MLS said no to that? And, um, and, and, and is there some, something beyond simply not wanting promotion and relegation? Well, for sure, that's it, right? There, you know, look, I mean, you got to, the way I look at it, you got to think of, you know, Sunil Galati, the some arrangement, you know, that exists between um, the USSF and MLS, the alliances that they have with USL, you know, uh, and as their way of dealing uh, with U.S. soccer and be in control of the future of U.S. soccer, you know, which that's the way they see it, and and that's the reason why we are in the situation that we are in today, okay? Because they haven't given, you know, uh, people like myself, you know, and there's a lot of pro rail, you know, individuals that I read on Twitter every day, right? There's been a lot of surveys independent service taken that people in America, now that they they see all these phenomenal games that come out of the Bundesliga, the Liga, Serie A, and the Premier League, yeah, there's a huge appreciation of what soccer could be if we follow the European example, right? And, you know, so far, not only proposed a $400 million per year rights package, but within that $400 million per year rights package, 20% of that, $80 million per year, is going to be delegated or given to in support of the minor leagues, which is frankly the way it's done in most parts of the world, right? Where the top leagues share uh, their successes with the minor leagues, right? right. Like and uh, two payments. Excuse me? Uh, I was saying like parachute pay- uh, payments in terms of the... Parachute payments. So let's, you know, look, I mean, there's not, you know, we can't live and succeed, you know, in the, in the minor leagues without a television contract. You, you follow me? You know, some may lose a lot, some may lose a little, but everybody's losing, right? Sure. The television contract is what make it possible, and then the opportunity to get promoted to from one league to the other that doesn't exist in this country, right? That's huge, right? Uh, Silva's opinion, and my very, very strong opinion, is that promotion relegation would dramatically increase you know, the interest of the television audience in this country for MLF, you know, for professional man soccer. And as a consequence, you know, the dollar being thrown at a soccer would be greater. So everybody would, you know, it's a triple up top of uh, our situation. What's amazing is the USSF uh, also makes night remarks, you know, to the Silva proposal. They, they never sit down with Silva and say, tell us about this, there's some interest here, because it affects every league in this country, not just MLS. So they basically listened to what MLS had to say, and they never met with Silva again. And that's terrible. 
right? Because the last time I checked, USSR soccer is responsible for all the constituency of soccer, not just Doug, you know, Don Garber and his boys, you, if you follow me, right? Not just the MLS teams. Uh, the other thing, and I said it in my, my discussions in February 2017, there's a lot of teams within MLS, they're already used to promotion and relegation. Specifically, the two New York teams. You know, the guy that owns the Red Bulls is in Austria. He loans the team in, you know, in Germany. I think it's the name is Leipzig. I can't say those names. Yeah, Leipzig. Or Leipzig. Yeah. Right. Correct. And, and they moved from what Division Four, Division Three to Division One. They got 1, promoted. Right? Yeah, they got promoted three times in seven years. Okay, fine. And, and the people that own the Abu Dhabi people that own, you know, New York City FC, they also own Manchester City. Right now, you know, they're number one in the Premier League, I think, right? Um, Correct. And, and so is Saputo up in Montreal, and so are Kroenke. I mean, there's a lot of people, you know, they are familiar with and, and, and invest in money you know, in European soccer with the idea that if they don't succeed on the field, they may get relegated. So they accepted that. Why should the MLS owners not accept it? So let me give a warning, you know, to anyone that thinks of investing in MLS, you know, you know, uh, invest at your own risk because sooner or later, promotion relegation is going to come to this country. Okay? Um, yeah, is it going to be next year? But So let's see how our case turns out, you know, and then I may have some other things to talk about in a future podcast, but not right now, guys, all right? But this idea that you need to protect people's investment, you know, who's protecting my investment? You know, our league, you know, invested... You know, fifty million dollars, five zero. This shit. Is anyone worrying about expropriating me one day to sanction me from D two to something else? Right, right now we don't have a sanctioning. Did anybody ever say, you know, these guys spent fifty million dollars? We should all we also worry about them. Who's worrying about my my losses? Why are always MLS losses? Well, well, let, yeah, so let, let me transition then to this television deal. We, you referenced it earlier. There is a TV deal, uh, uh, and I don't know how much you can speak uh, freely, obviously, you're in the middle of litigation, but a television deal that covers the U.S. Soccer Federation that is negotiated by Soccer United Marketing, which is MLS, which is uh, part of MLS. So there is an established business relationship between the Federation and Major League Soccer which is largely unprecedented in, in, in world football. Um, if the NASL or USL also, any other league, uh, NPSL, U, UPSL, cannot get a television deal and is frozen out of that television deal, doesn't it adversely affect your business? And, and how, uh, how do you solve that? Well, you know, that's, <laughs> that's the whole reason for the lawsuit. Now, I didn't call for this. You know, that would have been phenomenally in a good shape, you know, uh, if they had done what they did in the prior seven years or give us room, you know, to correct what they viewed as our issues, right? You know, but at the end of the day, there's a huge conflicts here. Um, so we talked about who's there to worry about my, our least $50 million losses that we had this past year. Nobody other than us, right? So why, why should USSF, you know, primary objective be to protect the investments? And, and, and Sunil Galapia said these things, right? I'm not here to, you know, he made all kinds of, statements related to, I'm not here to expropriate, you know, people that have already made investment in the MLS. That's not my job. Well, it's also not your job to expropriate my investment that I made in the cosmos by sanctioning me, right? right. So, I mean, we have huge, huge conflicts here of the USSF taking a position, they're going to be joint at the hip, as it was mentioned in our lawsuit, as it was mentioned in a number of newspaper articles. You know, they go to, they talk to each other. Sunil Galati, according to a newspaper article that I've read, you know, and, and Don Garber, they say they talk to each other more frequently than they, they talk to their wives. 
Now, Rocco, what do you, what do you think it is that uh, USSF and MLS uh, fears about whether it's New York Cosmos or uh, NESL? Why are they acting this way? What do you, what do you think their, their thinking is? Well, in my opinion, it's not, no, look, they, they know my resources, you know, they know who I am, you know, they know I'm a local guy, they know I may not speak the right language the way you guys do, right, you know, but whenever I say something, people listen to me, right, they know my successes in the soccer world and in the media world, in the television world, and they also know that, you know, frankly, you know, there's very few people that graduate from Columbia that reached the level that I reached in the business world. In fact, zero almost. That both have, you know, a graduate and undergraduate degree from Columbia. You know, that, you know, I'm in the Columbia Hall of Fame, you know, in the Athletics Hall of Fame, uh, the newspaper, uh, 12 years ago, 15 years ago, whatever, they named me one of the top 250 alumni that ever graduated from Columbia in 250 years. I, I believe okay. you, you might be in the Forbes 400 as well. That might uh, ruffle their yeah. feathers. Right. Yeah, no, I, look, I mean, they know I have the resources, you know, to go out and find a better way, a different way, you know, to compete with the interests of MLS and Unfortunately, U.S. soccer. U.S. soccer should have been and should be the job to be an independent regulatory agency. There's no way in hell in any business that I've been involved with. Look, I've been in banking and I've been in the cable business. You know, the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, they don't have a financial interest with AT&T if AT&T is one of my competitors. You know, the Security and Exchange Commission that I file documents with that control the banking system, or the FDIC, fine. They don't have a financial interest with one of the banks. Why, why do we, is there a financial interest between my regulatory agency that's screwing me right now and MLS? What's this thing about some? Even if everything is up and up, it doesn't make sense. So there's fears out there, and you know there are, Right, that especially with the presidential election coming down, and I was, you're right, I was the first guy, and I think the only guy within Division One, Division Two, to ask for Sunil Galati's resignation. I mean, think about it. You know, we have this ter this disaster that's taking place with the U.S. national team, you know, that we should all be ashamed of, and not one owner, not Garber, no one, as publicly stated their position as to whether Bill Galati should still be involved with U.S. soccer or not. I mean, look what happened with the guy in Italy. You know, when Italy didn't get involved. Within three weeks, he was, within a week, he was out. Two weeks. A week, two weeks. First, they get rid of the coach, and they, they get rid of him, which is the honorable thing to do. Which is the honorable thing to do. How long do you need to have power? I mean, 30 years now. In one way or another, he's been involved with U.S. soccer. You know, do you need to go for the next 30 years to achieve your objectives? And what purpose does it serve? Who does it serve? Let the younger generation, you know, come in. Look, I mean, we have had a guy named Eric Ronaldo, I'm sure all of you know. Yeah, he came to the Cosmos game. He came, you know, to visit us. Uh, I didn't ask him. He came on his own from California to watch a Cosmos game, and he was on uh, on a television network saying his film. You know, uh, he, all, he was also in Miami. And and uh, the, the thing is, why is Eric, you know, uh, coming from California, you know, to come to a Cosmos game, and you, Sunil Gulati, who you know who Rocco is, at least within the Columbia University community, right? Why would you never come to a Cosmos game? You're too busy? Or we're not important? Or, 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 or we are, or is Rocco and the Cosmos a threat to somebody else? So you guys figure out, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Rocco, what do you mean? Rocco, uh, oh, go, go. actually, let me just jump in here, Kartik. Um, so what are your thoughts on the candidates who are running for the position of USSF president? And have you had a chance to speak uh, with many of them regarding your goals? Uh, the truth is now, except for Eric Winalda, is the first one that approached me directly, you know, and I, I like him. I haven't announced, you know, frankly, 
as to who I go to support eventually. You know, but what I like to see for every single one of those candidates is that they reestablish the USSF, you know, as a regulatory body, to the extent they're going to be my regulatory body, my sanctioning body, you know, that clears the USSF from any conflicts with any league. It's simple as that. I will not accept any candidates, okay, that, you know, that I will support, you know, unless that's the number one mission that they have, to make sure that if the USSF is going to be regulating me, they have to break away, frankly, from some and from the MLS. Period on the start. It's good for everybody. It should be good also for MLS, by the way. Let, right? let, me, let me ask you this. If uh, Yeah, it should, because there's too many entanglements now. Do you feel like U.S. soccer perhaps is getting shortchanged? The men's and women's programs are not receiving as much money as they would otherwise because uh, of the D- TV deal with some, and perhaps Soccer United Marketing is lobbing off more money uh, with that deal than they should. And, and maybe it's hurting our men. Maybe our men's program didn't qualify for the World Cup. Maybe it's hurting them. Uh, what, what is your thought on that? That's a theory of mine. Uh, uh, my thought is that, uh, you know, since I have more experience than all of them, frankly, when dealing with, uh, you know, with uh, sport, not sports rights, but programming rights, if you want. Sports is part of that, right? But I'm on the, I'm on the giving end. I pay money to ESPN, so ESPN can turn around and give money to the USSF. You, you understand how first my consumers pay yeah. me, and I take their money and give it to ESPN, and then ESPN turns that money and gives it to the USSF. My feeling is that if Sunil promises, or anybody that runs for president, okay, um, of the USSF, if they think there's any shortfalls at all by breaking away those relationships, Rocco would be the first one to guarantee to them that I'll make the shortfalls. Okay, you want me to say it in English now? <laughs> yeah, basically got it, right. So um, if uh, there is... So if they come to you and say, look, if we're going to break away from some or the USSF, I mean from MLS, and it's going to be a shortfall because they do a better job than somebody else for the television right. You know, and by the way, when we say break away, break away the national teams, right? You cannot have the national teams, you know, combined with those rights. You follow me? Which brings a lot of value to MLS. I'm saying I'll yeah. be the one that was willing to guarantee to them, you know, this more, not just the same, more proceeds that they now get to the extent that they promise the soccer world that they're going to dis- that they're going to disentangle themselves from their relationship with the MLS. Correct. Right. Okay. And I have the, and I have the resources to do it. So if they think they're making, I get, let's pick a number. If they think they're making fifty million dollars a year, you know, because of the com- combination of you know the. Yeah, of the common uh, sale of those flights, you know, the national teams, the whatever, the CONCACOF, whatever the hell it is, right? With MLS, I guarantee, you know, at least that kind of money to the USSF, you know, for a long period of time, as long as they do sanction. As long as they, you know, break, break those cords and become the, you know, and become the, the, the sanctioned body and become the independent uh, federation that they should have always been. In other words, a federation that worries about everybody's interests, not just the MLS. So if, the, so if they're an independent arbiter, they're an independent body that regulates uh, leagues under that, that, that are member leagues, as they should be, as they are in much of the world, uh, soccer federations, you could guarantee that um, whatever shortfall in revenue they get from negotiating a TV deal, which, by the way, again, I, I, I don't have all the facts, I don't have all the numbers, but I don't believe the shortfall will be very great. I, I think the media companies, ESPN, Fox, and Univision, pay for um, more for the national team rights, men's and women's, than they do for MLS, right? I think MLS is almost a throw-in in that package, if you're being perfectly objective about it. Um, Listen, uh, Hardik, I didn't want to say that. These are words from you, but let's correct. assume I sort of agree with you, all right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Right. So I don't think the shortfall will be very great to begin with. Um, how do you disentangle the USSF from Soccer United Marketing? This is the 
$9 million question, uh, Rocco, um, and guarantee that your league and every other league will be independently uh, governed? I say, look, I mean, look, I mean, I think that, frankly, I think there's a difference. I don't know how it's done all over the world, but clearly there's a difference between amateur and professional, right, uh, soccer. You know, maybe there's got to be two components of USSF, right? One related to profession, one related to amateur. And, and by profession, I mean women and men, right? Yeah, but at the end of the day, everybody's got to have representation uh, on the board. And, you know, I, you know, a guy like Don Garber should not have, you know, veto control on any decision that the USSF makes. It's as simple as that. You know, the pro council needs to be refigured, redone. And the USSF should fully behave as an independent agent, right? Maybe it's more important than us because the teams are involved, but he should certainly not have, if, if, if the MLS, if the USSF is in the job of sanctioning him the way they sanction us, right, he should not be in the, in a position as veto rights and appointment rights of anybody that belongs in that council. Now, regarding the um, NSL, uh, the federal antitrust lawsuit against USSF, I mean, I, of course, the, the, the case is still ongoing, but is there anything you, you want to share or get off your chest regarding that case that you can talk about? Well, <clears throat> unfortunately, very little. We have uh, today, I guess I should say, we filed our second reply you know, we, we're, we're going through the appeal process in the appellate court in, in, in New York. Uh, and, uh, yeah, to the extent that we get the injunction, I think it's safe to say, you know, that we're going to be playing in 2018. Um, to the extent that we don't, then it's safe to say that probably the Cosmos will not play in 2018. That's, that's, just, that's it. Yeah, the lawsuit will continue. Let me just say that. The lawsuit will continue. The lawsuit will never be stopped. You know, and I don't think, frankly, that the USSF or MLS or some will ever want to be in that situation. You know, because what the lawsuit means is that you know, we're going to go through a discovery phase. There's going to be depositions under law. You know, there's going to be emails, um, you know, emails that were written, you know, 10, 20 years ago. I don't know, five years ago. Everything is discoverable. And unless, you know, uh, people, you know, want to risk going to jail, you know, everything's going to be found out about as to what really transpired in the last five years, ten, you know, five years, ten years with the linkage between U.S. soccer and the MLS, yeah. right? And and I think, frankly, you know, I know it's a higher threshold, you know, to win the injunction or even the appeal. I I, I understand that, right? But it's a lower threshold from what I've been told, you know, to win the lawsuit, okay? It may take years, right? It may take a year, two years, but we'll see what happens. Now, naturally, there's a, you know, there's a, 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 a presidential election that's taking place, you know. Um, I'm sure that those people that are running for president, you know, they're going to be talking about this, and who knows what happens. Maybe we get the right person to become the next president of the USSF, which things will change on their own, and we don't have to find, yeah, we don't have to worry about the results of the lawsuit. But we are at the court, just to, just, to, just to make it transparent. When we were at the court hearing, which I appeared, uh, you know, it's like the church, you have two aisles, right? You have the middle aisle with a wife and husband go to get married, your father, and then you got the left and the right, right? The wife and the husband. You, I don't know if you've been to an Italian wife, but that's the way we do it, right? So on the right, we have everybody that was supportive, uh, or lawyers for, you know, the, you know, the NSL. We had newspaper reporters, we had players, we had team members, we had people that worked for, and I, you had me, you had Rishi, you know, and, um, Chris uh, Hines from, uh, California, and a few other MLS people, uh, uh, NSL people. On the other side, you're not the only one that showed up for the court hearing, four lawyers from the MLS. Now, is this crazy or what? So what, what, what do the four lawyers from the MLS were doing there? Why, why do they have to have four? Theoretically, they're not a party to this lawsuit, correct? 
Well, they may be a party to the lawsuit. They, but shouldn't they stay behind and not make it too obvious that the MLS is, is, is giving advice to the USSF as to what they should do? And I think that's what's been happening here. What's been happening here that someone at the MLS, you know, is taking care of the MLS interest by influencing what Sunil Gulati may or may not want to do going forward or the boiler USS. And that's pretty serious stuff. Okay? Now, all of that, frankly, at some point, that will come out as the law you know, will proceed whether we win the injunction or not. So let me restate it again. The lawsuit will go on, you know, as long as I'm around, okay? You know, as long as we get treated the way we have been treated, the lawsuit will stay around, you know? The lawsuit will only stop when somebody, you know, represent the U.S. assessors, you know, we're willing, you know, to do the right thing and, you know, and and renegotiate something that makes you guys feel good. Now, time is running out, right? Because, you know, we got to be prepared for the 2018 season, right? And uh, so it's running out on me and it's running out on them because they're going to own, they're going to own this decision for the rest of the history of U.S. soccer. That they put out of business an entire league. They will own that decision. That's going to be a smack in the face for the next 50 years of anyone involved with U.S. soccer as to what the United States Soccer Federation has done to a league and to the Cosmos. Well, New York uh, Cosmos chairman and owner, Rocco Camiso, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Okay, guys, thank you. I appreciate your time, too, all right? Thank you. All right, Kartik, so uh, where can listeners find you on the internet? You can find me at Twitter at KKFLA737. Uh, look for me uh, on Facebook at uh, uh, Carter Krishnar or Google Plus, uh, and obviously at World Soccer Talk and uh, some other locations online, worldsoccertalk.com. All right, well, thank you for listening. You can get a new episode of the World Soccer Talk podcast every Thursday. Every episode is released on SoundCloud, YouTube, Stitcher, iTunes, TuneIn, AudioBoom, and worldsoccertalk.com. If you like to like the show, share it with your friends on social media and give us a review on iTunes. We'd greatly appreciate it. And Kartik, what should they do? Enjoy your football.